Welcome to church. And welcome to week one of a brand new series called Relationship Playbook. Very excited about this series. Let me take a moment, just give a shout out to all of our locations this weekend. New Ark, Hokesson, online, and so excited about what God is doing at our different locations. If you're here for the first time, we are starting this brand new series all about relationships, so whether we're married, divorced, single, young, old, dating, wondering if we'll ever date again, parenting, trying to get along with our parents and figure out what that looks like. Wherever we are, whatever our relationship status, we're going to talk about how to make relationships work when it feels like there's so much working against us. And not only uh, do we fall in a lot of different places in our relationships, but for some of us, maybe we're still trying to figure out what we believe about God and church, and we're going to get very practical during this series and also ask the question, how could everything in our lives improve if our relationships got better? So you're going to want to come back every weekend during this series, and let me just take a moment and say as well that if you typically join us at our Newark location on Sundays, and especially if you usually come to the 1030 on Sundays, you may have noticed uh, if you've been there, that it's full, like it's really full. There are a lot of people and a lot of cars trying to find parking spots. So I would encourage you during this series to make the switch. Saturday nights are awesome. So make the switch to Saturday night if you gather at our Newark location. And then also, if you live in the Hokesson area or maybe up in PA or anywhere around uh, that area, we meet at Wilmington Christian School. Great things happening at that location. You also have an opportunity over the next few weeks to get in on the ground floor of our new coming soon Middletown location. And I just encourage you so that more people can find hope and help for their relationships during this series. If you can join us at one of our other locations or join us at a less full gathering time, uh, you can help make room for more people. So you ready for relationship playbook? Everybody ready? Here we go. It's going to be a great next few weeks. So to kick us off, a few years after we got married, uh, Susie, my wife, and I had a disagreement. I don't know how many of you have ever had a disagreement in a relationship. We've just had the one. Um, Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, We actually had a lot of disagreements, especially early on in our marriage. But the reason I remember this one in particular is because we both got pretty heated. And in a moment of frustration, I looked at Susie and I asked her this question, this life-giving question. What is fundamentally wrong with you? (laughs) And I've actually shared, I don't know why I'm in this season of kind of sharing some of these things. I think it's because our marriage is actually really healthy. And so we now feel like we can talk about the early years. (laughs) But uh, just in a moment of frustration, we were arguing and I just asked this question, what is fundamentally wrong with you? Now, this has become the stuff of legend for us today. We laugh about it now. Uh, We did not laugh at the time. Uh, But I can assure you that even though I'm the one who asked the question, we would both agree that we were, we were both thinking about, thinking that about the other person. What is fundamentally wrong with you? Not just what's wrong with you, but what's fundamentally wrong with you? So here's what I want to do front end beginning of this series. How many of us, all of our locations have ever wondered about anybody you're related to, friends with, dating, married to, used to be married to? What is fundamentally wrong with them? Come on, show of hands. Come on, show of hands. Honestly, it's going to be a long series if you don't get honest week one. Yeah. What is fundamentally wrong with you? Relationships are hard, right? And they leave us wondering, why are we so different? Why do they think the way they think? Why do they act the way they act? What is going on? Why are we so fundamentally different? Just seems like we'll never be able to see eye to eye. We'll never get on the same page. We'll never have harmony in this relationship. So what is that all about? Well, there is some stuff written in the Bible that actually might help us understand this and get better at our relationships. It is written to a church, but it's really all about relationships. So first part of this, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how God sees relationships within the church. But if you're new to church, again, still trying to figure out what you believe, we will get very practical with this and you'll see how it applies really to all of our relationships. So it all starts with a little lesson in human anatomy. Here we go. This is in the New Testament of the Bible. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Now, if you're new to church, 
so glad you're here. You don't have to believe anything you're not ready to believe yet. You can kick the tires, you can soak it in. But you might be interested to hear this, that the church is described in the Bible as the body of Christ. It's really fascinating, right? It's a body of Christ. This whole church thing is a body. It has many parts, and yet it's just one body. It's kind of like a puzzle, if you think of it in those terms. A puzzle is a complete picture, but the picture is made up of hundreds, maybe even thousands of individual Pieces And the picture doesn't make sense without all the pieces, but any given piece doesn't really make sense outside of the bigger picture either. So the picture needs the pieces, and the pieces need the picture. Each piece is shaped differently, but when it connects, when it is connected to other pieces in the puzzle, it creates this bigger picture. And this is what God had in mind for the church. So for God, the church is not like a religious organization. It's not just this, it's not just a building. It's a living, thriving body, not a bunch of independent people. So not a bunch of people all doing their own thing. It's not a bunch of codependent people. So not a bunch of people who are all doing the same thing. They don't think for themselves or bring any uniqueness to the table. Instead, it's a community of interdependent people who are uniquely shaped and wired and gifted and have unique experiences and stories, but are highly committed to joining together and working together for the sake of a bigger picture. That's what God had in mind for the church, but that's the church, right? So another message for another time, another series to talk about how God sees the church, what about our friendships and our marriages and our dating life or our single life or our single again life or all of those other relationships? Well, this is actually a picture of all of our relationships, or it can be. When you think about it, a family is made up of many parts, but it's just one whole family. Same with a circle of friends, same with a group, same with a marriage. As soon as you have at least two other people who are committed to try to do life together, you have these different parts in the relationship and you have the potential for a beautiful picture, a much better, bigger, deeper, richer picture than any one piece or any one person, any one part could experience or create on their own, right? But you also have the potential for problems. As soon as you have at least two people trying to do life together, you have the potential for a beautiful picture and you have the potential for some big problems. In fact, the human body has many different parts, not just one part. And if the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? So you have these unique parts of the human body, but it only works when they cooperate, when they work together. So for all of us who become followers of Jesus, you don't lose who you are when you put your faith in Jesus. Actually, you find who you really are, and we're always meant to be. Jesus unlocks the full potential of who we were actually created and intended to, To be, but we bring some of the same stuff that was true about us before we met Jesus is still true after we met Jesus. Much has changed. We've been transformed. We're given a new heart. We're a new creation. Our priorities begin to change. Our attitude begins to change. But a lot of stuff stays the same. If you were tall when you put your faith in Jesus, you're still tall. If you were short when you put your faith in Jesus, speaking for a friend, still short. Like that didn't change. If you were very outgoing and then you put your faith in Jesus, chances are good. You're still outgoing. If you were very introverted, put your faith in Jesus, chances are good. You're still introverted. Now, some of you might say, well, I put my faith in Jesus and I immediately became way more outgoing. You probably were always outgoing. You just didn't have the confidence to know who you really were until Jesus unlocked that within you. So as I say, well, I became much more introspective. No, you just didn't realize how noisy you were before you found Jesus. He helped you take a step back. All right, do you understand what I'm saying? We don't lose who we are when we find Jesus. We find who we are. How? By letting go of who we thought we were. Letting go of our life as we understand it and try to control it. And then we really lean into this new life that we have 
in Jesus. But there's a difference. You say, well, that sounds a lot like a very positive message I've heard in my life. Like, you do you, right? Have you heard that? Like, just be you. How many of us have heard that message? Be you, just be you, man. Be you. The problem with that message on its own is that there's no reason. Just be you. Why? I don't know, because it's just, just be you. You just do you. Well, for what purpose? Just because. Stop asking questions and just be you. Jesus says, don't just be you. Be the real you for the sake of something bigger than you. Be the real you because you're actually connected to and part of something or can be connected to and part of something much bigger than you and you can create, help create a better and bigger picture than you could on your own. So we all bring different things to the table, but the reason we bring our different personalities and experiences and stories to the table now is not just for the sake of ourselves, it's for the sake of the table. We're a part of something bigger. And yet, here's what happens so often in our relationships. We mistake differences in personality or perspective as differences in value. So often, we all do, we're all guilty of this at times, myself at the top of the list, we mistake differences in personality or perspective as differences in value. We think, well, we're different, so doesn't that mean one of us must be wrong? And how we usually think is, we're different. One of us must be wrong. I'm pretty sure it's you. That's how we kind of think about relationships. I see things one way. You see things a different way. We can't both be right. One of us must be wrong. And then we kind of fall into this thing that happens often in our world without God and without faith where we just, well, you do you and you be you just for the sake of that, instead of understanding that actually we're supposed to leverage our differences so that everyone gets better. So after that fateful moment in our marriage, when I asked Susie what was fundamentally wrong with her, we started a process in our relationship of slowly learning that not all our differences meant something was fundamentally wrong with either of us. We started to appreciate our differences to learn to highlight the part that each of us is uniquely shaped to play in our relationship. See, any relationship has different parts, and the different parts actually make up one whole relationship. The relationship would not be the same without the different parts. For instance, this is a foot. <laughs> now, it's not a real foot, because that would be weird. You wouldn't come to church here anymore if this was a real foot. And that'd be the right decision, by the way. But pretend, for the sake of the message, this weekend, this is a real foot. Can we all agree that a foot on its own is terrifying? It's terrifying. Can we all agree that if you go home today and there is a human foot lying outside your door, the only appropriate response is to completely lose your mind, <laughs> right? You don't go, oh, look, at, oh, honey, it's a foot. It's, let me get a, let me post here with the foot. You don't do that, right? That's weird. Can we all disagree? It's, that's, you freak out. You call the police. You run the other way screaming at the top of your lungs. These are all appropriate responses to finding a foot on its own outside your door, which by the way, is exactly how weird and terrifying it should be to meet a Christian who isn't connected to a church. Just a thought, another message for another time. Don't worry, it's not what this series is about. But just so you know. So if you meet somebody who's like, I'm a Christian, you say, oh, great. I mean, what, what church, what community of faith are you a part of? Oh, I don't do that, but I'm a Christian. Ah! Call the police, Okay. <laughs> I found, found a Christian not attached to the church. It's weird. It's like something's not good here. <laughs> Get it back on the rails, Johnston. Here we go. <laughs> but what if the foot says, you know what? I don't really belong in this relationship because I'm not a hand. I mean, how bizarre would that be if the foot said, I don't really belong here. I'm not a hand. This, this is not for me. I'm out of here. Can we all agree as well 
that this will not play out well for the foot, the hand, or the rest of the body. Everybody loses if the foot is like, I'm out. I just don't belong. Okay, we just spell it out just a little bit more. This is an ear. It's not a real ear. Uh, but let's pretend that it is. And this is an eye, not a real eye. Okay, can you imagine an ear saying, being attached to the same head as this eye just isn't working for me. In fact, to be honest with you, I feel like seeing is the only thing that's valued here. People aren't paying enough attention to me. I'm gonna go find more ears. That's what I need in my life. I need a lot more ears around me. I don't wanna be around eyes anymore. I just wanna be around ears. Can we all agree that this would not play out well for the ear, the eye, or the rest of the body? I mean, how frustrated would you be with your foot if it got insecure because it wasn't your hand and stopped doing the job that the foot is supposed to do You'd be very upset. How frustrated would you be with your ear if it got an attitude towards your eye? You need it to be your ear. You'd be like, stop it, you guys. I need you both. <laughs> eye, I need you to see. Ear, I need you to hear. It doesn't matter how good the eye is at its part. It cannot do the ear's part. You say, oh, that's so silly. That's so simplistic. I know, and it's so true because here's what it means. Immature people only see others through the lens of their own personality and preferences. But mature people get it. Our differences don't make us better or worse. They just make us different. It's not a value statement. They just make us different. Now, I know some of us are a little bit nervous about this because we're thinking, yeah, but what about the issues that my parent has or my friend, my spouse, my kid, my sibling? Those may be legitimate issues. So I am not suggesting that what makes us different is an excuse for our dysfunction. Sometimes an eater gets infected and that needs to be dealt with. Sometimes a foot smells like funk <laughs> and the foot cannot say, well, I'm just a foot. This is how I smell. No, wash yourself. <laughs> like, okay, so there are legitimate issues in our relationships have to be addressed. We're going to talk about that next weekend. We're going to talk about conflict and how we address some of those things when there's, it goes beyond a personality difference and there's dysfunction in the relationship. All very important, but listen, we can't even begin to tackle that stuff wisely and well in our relationships until we understand that underneath those issues, there is a person who has the potential to play an important part in the relationship. And their differences do not mean they are better or worse than us, just different from us. So we have a choice. Those differences can either become the recipe for resentment or the recipe for a more fulfilling relationship, and it's up to us. In fact, listen to this next part. If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. I lead a great team of pastors here. We work very closely together. We meet every week. I have a, a team of pastors that I lead directly. We, every week we meet and we talk about this church and you and how we can serve you better and how we can help more people gather, connect, and serve in our region and find Jesus and follow him fully. And we, a few years ago, started quoting this little saying at the start of every one of our meetings. This is my team. Its success is my success. I win if this team wins. I lose if this team loses. Why? Because we want to remind ourselves every time we get in a room together that we are a team. We are not a bunch of individual contributors. We are part of a bigger picture. And we only win if this team wins. So we want to remind ourselves, hey, our differences don't make us better or worse. They just make us different. And if we'll all bring the uniqueness of our shape and our design and our personality and our experiences to the table, the bigger picture can unfold and it'll be good. That difference is the very thing that makes the bigger picture possible. So let me ask you the question, week one of the series, I mean, what would happen if we all adopted this? This is my family. Its success is my success. I win if this family wins but I lose if this family loses. This is my marriage. I win if this marriage wins. I lose if this marriage loses. This is my church. 
I win if this church wins, I lose if this church loses. What if the person you're so frustrated with right now because they don't think the way you think, they don't see things the way you see things, they don't react the way you react was actually placed there by God just the way he wanted? You say, but I wish they were more like me. If they were more like us, the relationship could never be what God intended it to be. Here's the next part. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. It would be a horror movie waiting to happen. (laughs) Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Now remember, this is written to a specific church. And this was a church that had some things going for it, but they also had some issues. They had some pretty big issues. And this was one of their biggest issues. People in this church were constantly trying to prove that they were most important, that their gifts were most relevant, that their preferences mattered most, that their ideas and their thoughts should be given precedence over everyone else's. And Paul, who wrote this to these Christians, people who said they were followers of Jesus, he says, this is like feet and ears and eyes and noses fighting over which of them is most important. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense because it's what we're part of that brings significance to our lives. Our gifts on their own mean nothing. Only when we connect them with others do we see the bigger picture of what God had in mind because our differences don't make us better or worse. They just make us different. So does that mean we're not responsible when our personality quirks create problems in a relationship? No, we're gonna talk about that next week. Actually, it means just the opposite. That each of us is responsible to bring the very best us to the bigger picture of any relationship we're a part of. That's our responsibility. I am responsible to bring the best me to the relationship. You are responsible to bring the best you to the relationship. And part of bringing the best us means making space for what makes the other person different from us. Valuing that. Understanding that. But here's the reality. And the reason we're doing this series, because many of us have very few healthy examples to look to when it comes to quality relationships. So for a lot of us, we've seen independence in relationships. So we've seen relationships where each person just kind of does their own thing, regardless of how it affects anyone else. They agree to disagree and never challenge each other, never confront each other. They just kind of do their own thing, and at the end of the day, they're in it for themselves, independence in a relationship. We've seen codependence, which is where someone puts up with dysfunction in the relationship because they are feeding off of it in an an unhealthy way. They don't want to be alone. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to address anything, so they just become codependent on the other person, and issues are never addressed. We've seen that. We've seen independence where people do their own thing. We've seen codependence where people tolerate dysfunction. But very few of us have seen a lot of quality relationships where there's interdependence. Interdependence is where I know who I am and I have clear boundaries. But I no longer do what I do just for the sake of myself. I willingly do what I do for the sake of others, for the sake of the relationship. That's rare. And that's why we're doing this series, because if we can get relationships like that in our lives, our whole life will get better. Our mental health will improve. Our spiritual health will improve. Our attitudes will improve. Research shows we'll live longer. We'll be more fulfilled, more content. We'll be more in tune with our own purpose. So for week one, what do we do? Well, first, here's the first thing. We stop wondering what is fundamentally wrong with the people in our life. So that's step one. So I'll give you a minute. Think of the person that in the back of your mind recently you thought, what? I just don't even understand what is wrong with him. How do we ever end up together? How do we ever end up with the same last name? How do we ever end up 
in this relationship. I just don't understand what is wrong with him. First step, stop wondering what is fundamentally wrong with the people in our life beyond them being a broken human being who needs God just like we do. That is actually something we all share. Some of us have gotten in this place. I'm going to speak to those of us who are followers of Jesus. We've gotten in this place. We recognize we're broken and we're sinful and we need God, but we think we're not as broken or as sinful as some other people, which is kind of like me saying I'm a whole lot better at dunking in basketball than someone who's five foot one. The ball's still not going in the net, people. (laughs) So, well, you got closer. Yeah, close doesn't count. And so for some of us, we recognize how much we need God on one level, but we just look at other people and go, man, they need God a whole lot more than me. We just all need God. Can we just agree on that? We just all need God. So we stop wondering what is fundamentally wrong with this other person, and then we make a commitment. It's the first rule in the relationship playbook. I'm going to give you four during this series. Here's the first one. Rule number one, we know and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. We know and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. By the way, this is something I've been teaching and coaching and using to lead this church for years. It works in our relationships. What does it mean? It means you get to know the other part of the team you're on, the other person in the relationship. And by the way, it means you actually get to know the person you're in a relationship with, not the person you wish you were in a relationship with. So it means getting to know the real person, your actual spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend or fiance, not your fantasy version. It means you get to know and understand your actual parent, not your friend's parent that you wish your actual parent were more like. The actual person in your life. It means laying down resentment. It means resisting the urge to blame or withdraw. It means asking lots of questions. It means that we seek first to understand before demanding to be understood. In your relationships, it means you begin to replace criticism with curiosity. It means you start to verbalize the other person's strength. So you actually say, you know, you are really good at X. And some of you are going, I can't say that because they're so terrible at A through W. Yeah, but you start to highlight their strengths. You are really good at this. You really shine in this area. Doesn't matter that there are weaknesses. You highlight the strengths. And then it means you begin to understand the actual weaknesses that are in that person's life. He gives you the silent treatment because what his dad used to do in that situation was get mad and yell, and he doesn't want to do that. And so instead, he gives you the silent treatment. Doesn't mean it's not a weakness. Doesn't mean it doesn't need to be addressed. But now you bring compassion to the relationship because you understand why. And compassion is one of the greatest tools you can bring to a relationship. She loses her temper when she's scared. He stops texting back when he's feeling ashamed. She forgets things when she's worried. Now you know and you understand. Those issues may still need to be addressed, but you know and understand. And where does that get you? This makes for harmony among the members, among the people in the relationship. So that all the members, all the parts care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Harmony. Doesn't that sound great? That's what we're after, right? I want harmony in my relationships. How do you get it? It starts with at least one person in the relationship making a decision. Their differences don't make them better or worse. They just make them different. Now it's not a value statement. So here's how you can live this out when it comes to your faith. Talked about how you can live it out in your relationships this week. Let's talk about it in your faith. First, get plugged in here. If you already have a church that you're a part of, get plugged in there. But if you've been coming here, get plugged in. Step one is this weekend. We'll help you find your part in the body of Christ. You don't need to be a foot out there on your own. That's terrifying. This puzzle is not complete without you. Listen, you will never be complete without this puzzle. They work together. So get plugged in here. Second, if you're not in a J group yet, join a J group and show up this week and do life with other people. This is how we care for each other here. This is how we do what the Bible teaches. We do life with each other. You're the foot, you're the hand, you're the ear, you're the eye that that group needs. 
and you need that group to get connected. Doing life with a few people going the same direction spiritually is how we live out being the body of Christ. And then third, especially if you're new to all of this, just come back next weekend. We're gonna get to the second rule in the relationship playbook, all about how to handle conflict. And all of us have it, we've all faced it, or we've all avoided it in our relationships. There's a better way. But for this week, make a commitment to know and understand the strengths and weaknesses of somebody you're in a relationship with so that relationship can get better. And if you receive that, I wonder, all of our locations, would you just lift your hand, just hold it up. If you'd say, I want that in my life. Online, you can lift your hand right where you are right now. The fed up to God. Let me pray for us. God, we come to you. Come on, join me in this. God, we come to you and we acknowledge that we need you. Nobody knows and understands us like you do. God, you see our strengths. You see our weaknesses. You uniquely designed us not just to be us, period, but to be a piece that fits into a bigger whole. We don't lose our identity when we submit ourselves to you and to each other. We actually find our real life, our real identity. And I pray that over us. God, I pray for relationships that need hope. I pray for relationships that need healing. Over the next few weeks, God, you would do a supernatural work in our friendships, in our families, in our marriages, in our, in our groups. God, that you'll restore, that you'll heal, that you'll bring hope. And God, we commit ourselves to that. This first week of the series, we commit ourselves to being like you in our relationships, seeking to know and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. Give us patience, clarity, and grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. If you're here for the first time or if you're still trying to figure out what you believe about Jesus, I'm not here to twist your arm. Just come back next week. You owe it to yourself to just see what God can do in your life. But there may be some of you in the room right now, one of our physical locations are watching online and you don't have a real relationship with God yet and you sense that God's drawing you to him. No relationship in your life, listen, will ever make complete sense until you have a relationship with God. He's the one that makes it clear who you are, whose you are how your life was designed to work. And the way you get to know the God who created you and loves you is through Jesus. Jesus reveals who God is and bridges the gap between you and the God who created you. So if you wanna take that step today, I'm gonna lead us in prayer again, and this is your opportunity, this is your moment, if that's you, to begin following Jesus. I want everyone to join me, just open your heart up big to God, block out every distraction. And if that's you today, whatever your story, whatever your past has looked like, if you wanna put your faith in Jesus today, right where you are, whisper out a prayer of faith, something like this. You can use my words if it helps you. Pray with faith from your heart. Jesus, today, I believe in you. I believe you died to forgive my sins. I believe you rose again and you're real. I'm leaving behind the life I've lived without you. From this day forward, I wanna follow you. Save me today. And if that's you, while everyone around you stays focused on God, if you would say, count me in, I wanna be included in that. I'm putting my faith in Jesus today. Will you lift your hand, just hold it up high, boldly. I'm putting my faith in Jesus, yes. Trusting him with my life, yeah. Online, type the word faith in the comments, whatever platform you're on, share that with us. And then Journey, will you help me? Come on, let's celebrate that. Let's give Jesus all the praise.